whilst people might think that the moon looks a bit grey and boring and all the same, it's really not. It's geologically diverse and we know that from the satellites that we've sent there to map its surface. My name is Catherine Joy. I'm a lunar geologist. I work at the University of Manchester in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. I do research into the moon's geological past. I study samples from the moon and I'm involved with a variety of space missions that have gone to the moon to collect data that they've sent back to the Earth. And so we're here, at, we're celebrating 50 years since the Apollo 11 moon landings. Um, how important was the Apollo program for learning about the moon? So the Apollo missions are the accumulation of kind of a huge scientific and exploration initiative. Over six missions, we sent 12 human beings to the lunar surface, all of whom were test pilots, apart from on the last mission where we had a geologist, Jack Schmidt, that went along. So the missions collected a huge amount of lunar samples. We've got about 382 kilograms of moon rock that were collected, most of which is stored in America at Houston and the Johnson Space Centre. But we don't just have the moon rocks, we have data from the, the scientific experiments that are operating on the moon that were left there by the astronauts. And these range from a variety of different experiments from seismology, so measuring things like moon quakes, which can tell us about the interior of the moon structure, so how thick its crust is, how big its core is, and if the core is still active all the way through to instrumentation to measure the heat close to the lunar surface, which tells us about how active the interior of the moon is. We also collected samples of the solar winds, so we left out kind of collection devices at the start of the um, spacewalks and then they were collected at the end. And this tells us about the chemical composition of the sun. So we're not just learning about the moon as a geological object, we're also learning about the moon's place within the wider solar system. And those moon rocks that are collected are still being studied today. So many of them are still being worked on in the US, but within Europe there are many research groups, including several in the UK. We've got about 10% of all lunar samples on loan are being researched right here. Um, and we're investigating lots of different scientific questions. So how old is the moon? How old are the rocks on its surface? When did lava flows form and volcanoes erupt? How did the moon get its crust? And when was that crust kind of hit and modified by impacting um, asteroids and comets? And more widely, what do those processes tell us about Earth's own history? Because whatever was kind of going on on the moon was also happening on the Earth. And yet that early record is not preserved here. So we look to the moon to unravel an awful lot of information about our own planet's geological history and how the Earth got its water and how that's going to turn into an atmosphere and a hydrosphere and a biosphere. So the moon plays a really pivotal role in our own uh, understanding, our own past and origins. Before Apollo, they didn't really know what the surface of the moon kind of was going to look like or feel like, did they? Because I remember at, listening to some of the audio from Apollo 11 and you can hear Neil Armstrong trying to describe what the surface kind of looks like. Yeah, so before Apollo, um, there was a lot of debate about whether the surface was just going to be so dusty if the astronauts kind of stepped off the spacecraft, if they if they disappear up to their heads in dust, never to be seen again. Now, there were some precursor missions called the Surveyor Landers that were sent to test this question and to test kind of pinpoint precision landing technology. And they carried on um, boards, cameras, some instruments to measure the surface chemistry. And they kind of addressed the question that the moon surface was probably going to be safe to land on. But as to the rocks that were there, this was a really big debate. So prior to Apollo, some scientists thought that the moon was a very, very old object, similar to asteroids. So we, we call those primitive objects that were formed kind of from the early solar system dust. Whereas if uh, a lot of other geologists were like, no, the moon's going to be a hot place which underwent a very violent history. So there was this debate backwards and forwards. And as soon as that box of rocks was opened back at NASA, there were geologists kind of crawling all over them to ask these types of questions. And within just a few days, they realised that actually many of the rocks were pretty similar to those we have on Earth. So lavas like we see in places like Hawaii or Iceland that tell us that the moon was a volcanically active world in its past. And they were able to conduct age dating studies to work out when those volcanoes erupted and then piece together kind of our geological history of the moon. Mm. So Apollo 11 was really pivotal. We learned probably about 80% of what we know from lunar geology just from you know those first few samples that were opened and analyzed. But the really amazing thing about the samples is they've been curated really well, so looked after by NASA for future generations to do research on. And so we're still asking new questions to the samples. We invent new analytical techniques that can study smaller and smaller sample masses. And we can measure 
chemical elements and oxides and compounds now that we could never measure back in the 1960s and 70s. And so our new investigations of those moon rocks are uncovering brand new things about the moon. And in particular, some of the recent findings suggest that actually we thought the moon was really dry, that it had no water, but some of the very new measurements tell us actually the moon's interior is quite wet. It's, it's not too dissimilar from some parts of the Earth's interior. And that helps us to address all sorts of interesting questions about how the moon first formed, how it lost its water and volcanic processes. And it helps us to ask, where did that water come from? Was it brought to the moon by impacting comets and asteroids? Was it there, first of all, when the moon was first formed? And it's also telling us how much water there actually is in the moon, which is important for thinking about what we do next. So could we use those water, those resources for future exploration to gather them, to use them in a usable way to say convert to oxygen that we can breathe, we can convert them to rocket fuel that we can use in a future spacecraft. So, you know, they're really, these sorts of new questions we're asking samples are having profound effects of thinking about what we want to do next. And the question of how the moon formed, is that um, something that generally there's quite a consensus about or do, do people not really agree on the theories? Yeah, I'd say that the main theory that people can agree on is that satisfies the geochemical evidence, the modelling evidence, the physics evidence, is the fact that the moon formed in a giant impact event. So a collision between a large body, um, probably uh, sort of about the size of Mars, and a proto-Earth that was probably a bit smaller. So the big debate comes, what happened next? So. Mm. Were those blows, was the impact kind of head on? Was it a glancing blow? How much material was thrown off from the impact? The types of temperatures and conditions. So was there a vapor cloud of material exchanging between the moon and the earth during this early period? And those types of things are what we're trying to test at the moment. So analyzing more samples to get better geochemical data and running computer simulations using kind of the latest computer power, the latest computer technology. And those sort of the two fields of the computer simulations and the geochemistry are merging together to mm. try and come up with an answer. But every six months, a new study comes out saying it's slightly <laughs> differently. They tweak the parameters. And so I think the debate's going to rumble on and on and on for a little while. Mm. Can we learn more from bringing samples back from different parts of the moon? Yeah, so with Apollo, we've only sampled six places. We do have three other landing sites from some robotic landers that the Soviet Union sent to the moon, but actually it's a really few number of geological locations. We've never brought rocks from the far side, we've never brought rocks from the poles of the moon. And so our next phase of lunar geological exploration is to pick and choose some really good landing sites to go and get more samples from, to place um, seismometers to conduct more seismo uh, seismology experiments from places we know that could tackle really important scientific questions. So key impact basins that tell us about the impact cratering history of the moon, maybe the far side lunar highlands that tells us about how the moon's crust first formed, and the polar, the north and the south pole where we think there might be volatiles and ice bound up in some craters. So that's the job of the geologist is to say, you know what, we've got this question, we want to understand it, and there's where we think we want to go to get mm. samples. And, and that's what I find so exciting to sort of think of the end-to-end -end planning activities and then eventually getting those samples back in our laboratories here on Earth where we can address those questions. Personally, what, what made you decide to study the moon? Why were you interested in the moon? I did a geology degree, so I loved volcanoes and earthquakes and I love fossils mm. as well. And I did a planetary kind of module as part of my geology degree where I thought, ah, oh, okay, there are other planets out there with geology the same as they are on Earth. And I kind of, I ended up doing lunar geology a little bit by accident. I ended up doing a PhD involving a spacecraft mission. So I guess my story is, a little bit accidental. Um, I always loved space exploration and I loved sort of reading about Helen Sharman being the first British woman in space but it all kind of married together in this beautiful mix of strange coincidence which has sort of led me where I am today. I really enjoy thinking about what new questions we can ask the moon mm -hmm. to understand the earth and other planets in the solar system. What do you think are the big questions that we still need to answer? Yeah what we'd like to know is so we'd like to understand when the moon was bombarded by different things so whether were they all asteroids? Were they comets? When did they strike the moon? Mm -hmm. And that tells us about wider solar system processes. I'd love to understand where those volatiles come from. So we could grab a bit of ice, we could test it. Were they there from asteroids or comets? Were they there from the solar wind? I think if you asked 10 lunar geologists where they'd go on the moon and what they'd do, <laughs> they'd all give you a different answer. So yeah. I think we've all got our, you know, our pet project, but I'd say they're my sort of favourite ones. So who actually decides that? Who decides where, where they're going to sample the 
Yeah, quite... that's a good question. We'll get in a room and fight about it. <laughs> it sort of depends on the mission structure. So it depends on whether it's a robotic lander or if it's a crewed mission mm. or if it's an orbital mission. It's down to the question you want to solve. Mm. So if you want to address a question such as what is the age of this basin, you have to pick a really good safe landing site in that basin to go to. Whereas with a crewed mission, you know, if you send human beings, you can be a lot more ambitious. Yeah. You can send a pressurised rover or even an unpressurised rover and you can do some really smart planning for picking out traverses where you can actually address five or six different questions by going to different geological sampling stations and collecting a really broad suite of materials. So these are kind of big collaborative planning activities and it, you know, it won't just be NASA deciding, they'll have collaborators from the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, Russia and Canada. So all the collaborative missions going together will get together. So you're quite excited about the renewed interest in sending crewed missions to the moon? Yeah, yeah. I firmly believe that crew on surface gives you, you know, much more broad diversity mm -hmm. in terms of the science you can do than just sending robotic landers. I think there is definitely a place for robotic landers, there's a place for robotic sample return. But being a geologist, I was sort of inspired by reading about Helen Sharman and I, I really do think that having crew there gives you that scientific flexibility, that scientific serendipitous discovery, but also that human connection that, you know, robots are really cool, but meeting somebody who's been to space and has been mm -hmm. there and kind of reliving it through their eyes because not all of us will get that opportunity, I think that's a really powerful thing and I, mm -hmm. and I firmly hope that with going back to the moon it will be done as part of an international collaborative initiative it won't just be one nation doing it we'll we'll be going to the moon all together to ask some really good science questions yeah great thank you